may be seated. So last week we started a new series called Flex, learning from somebody that loved to flex his muscles, right? Loved, loved to flex his, his arm muscles, loved to flex like his, his wisdom and how smart he was, Samson. And his story is found in the book of Judges. Love for you to grab your Bible, turn there if you would. If you uh, want to look at a, the Bible on your smartphone or tablet, that's awesome as well. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can grab one uh, from there in front of you and turn to page 181, Judges chapter 15. We're going to begin actually by looking at a little bit, uh, picking up at, at the end of uh, chapter 14. But last, last week, we learned that we watched Samson, and he, he wanted, he saw this woman, right? And he wanted the woman. And, and so he had three, three attitudes that make strong men or strong people weak. The, the first one was lust. I want it. The, the second one is entitlement. I deserve it. And so there are things that Samson shouldn't touch, Samson shouldn't eat, Samson shouldn't do, but he gave himself a pass, like we can have a tendency to do, and say, I deserve it. And then the third attitude that Samson had, and we'll see that continues to pop up in Samson's life, is the attitude of pride. I can handle it. I'm good enough. I got this. I'm strong enough. I'm smart enough. I can handle it. And pride, Scripture says, leads to destruction. Pride goeth before a fall. At the end of chapter 14, Samson is married. They're having a celebration, and as part of the celebration, he had given a, a little riddle to the, to the Philistines, right? And the Philistines ended up being able to solve his riddle because they went and they threatened his wife. And his wife ends up going to him and getting the answer, goes back to the Philistines, tells them the answer. He's upset. He calls her a heifer, which again, I told you last week, guys, don't do that. And he goes, beats up some guys, takes their clothes to fulfill this, this gambling debt that he had and pays, the, pays it off. And we pick it up, chapter 14, verse 19, the second part of that. Burning with anger. Samson is upset, right? So he went up to his father's house. He leaves. And Samson's wife was given to the friend who had attended him at his wedding. I said last week as we finish this chapter, there's some foreshadowing of what's going to take place in the next chapter. Okay, we, we see Samson is what? He's angry. He's a hothead. When somebody's angry, does that usually lead to something good or something bad happening? Bad happening. How many of you ever made a bad decision out of anger? How many of you ever seen somebody else make a bad decision out of anger? Okay, usually... When somebody's angry, you, you know something's probably not going to happen that's going to be good, right? And then Samson's wife was given to a friend who had attended him at a wedding. Does this sound like something that might not end well? As we continue on, chapter 15. Later on, at the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. Why did Samson take a young goat to visit his wife? I think it was his way of saying, my bad. <laughs> okay, I know. Father's Day is next week. Dad jokes should only be used on Father's Day, right? I'm a pastor, so you get a double whammy. You get dad jokes and you get pastor jokes, and sometimes they combine together. But I don't know why he thought taking a goat would be a good idea, but just some kind of way of like saying, hey, Maybe they're going to slaughter it and let's have a barbecue, some type of thing along that line. But he takes this goat with him, right? And he goes to, to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room. But her father would not let him go in. Like, no, nah, I don't think you want to go in there. 
No, you can't go in there. Here's what he said, verse 2. I was so sure you thoroughly hated her, he said, that I gave her to your friend. And then the dad says, isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. I'm just guessing that the older sister wasn't nominating her dad for father of the year. Samson said to them, this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs. This is pretty, pretty impressive. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches, and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. That's a lot of destruction, friends. We get a kind of an idea, a little bit of an idea. I mean, probably even a grander scale of things, of the Canadian fires and so forth. But I don't know how much of the Canadian fires are completely destroying their livelihood, their, their, their fields their vineyards, the things that they're counting on for their livelihood. When the Philistines asked, who did this? They were told, Samson, the Timnite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his friend. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. I want to share four observations from this text with us today. First observation Poor judgment leads to more injustice. Last week we learned from Samson's mistakes. Today I think there is there's a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of different ones that made uh, that had poor judgment that we can learn from. Okay, good opportunity, equal opportunity to learn from pretty much everybody in this chapter. Let's start with Dad. We'll, we'll pick on dad. Next week is Father's Day. This week we can pick on dad. Okay, ultimately he paid a really, really high price for his poor judgment, right? He died and his oldest daughter died. Dad made a poor judgment. What contributed to his poor judgment? Assumption. He said, I was sure. He, he counted on, he made a judgment call, he made a decision based on his assumption that Samson wanted nothing to do with his daughter, right? How many of you have ever made an assumption? We, we've all assumed something, right? How many of you have ever made an assumption and you were right? I assumed this and I was right, okay? How many of you have ever made an assumption and you were wrong? How many of you have been wrong with your assumptions more than you've been right? Probably most of us, right? Because we don't know everything. He thought he knew Samson's heart and mind in this situation, right? And you can understand why he would come to the conclusion that he came to. Samson had just had the wedding, they had just gotten married, and he gets mad and he, he leaves his bride. Like, haven't even finished the honeymoon. And he goes back to dad's house. Like, well, that looks to me like you didn't really want her. So I gave her to somebody else that did want her. Your best man. Like, I can understand why the dad made the assumption and did what he did, but it was a poor judgment because Samson hadn't given up on his bride. He still wanted his wife, and rightfully, she was still his. How do we avoid this poor judgment, this contribution to a poor judgment? I think we can, can avoid making assumptions and making decisions based on assumptions by simply asking questions. I wonder how much of our life would be better, how many of our relationships would be better, if we simply would ask questions instead of 
making assumptions. Think about it in your own life. How would your life be different if you asked questions and not just made assumptions? Because we make decisions based on assumptions, and assumptions oftentimes are lacking information that would have been very helpful in making a decision. True? So we think of injustice. We think of lady justice. What comes to mind when you think of lady justice? Okay, there's two things, right? Scales come to mind, and we think of balance, right? What else comes to mind? Blind. You got the blindfold, right? And say justice is blind, which which there's a, a good reason for that, and the, the thinking behind that, the, the goal of that is that there's, there's no discrimination in the judicial system. That's, that's the objective, that, that justice is just looking at the, the reality, the truth, what is, what is actually there, the facts, and you let that determine the situation. Guilty or not guilty, the penalty and all of that, that it's not, well, they're a friend of mine, so we're going to go easy, or I don't really like them, so we're going to go harder. And none of that comes into play, that justice is blind. But the, the other side of that, though, is there's oftentimes injustice because of blindness, because there's something that we can't see. In this case, there was something that the dad didn't see. And so he made a decision, made a poor decision, based on the limited things that he could see. He couldn't see everything, but what he could see made him make a certain decision, and it was a, a poor decision, right? It ended up costing him and his daughter their lives. I'd say that's a poor decision based on the results of things. But he's not the only one. But certainly we can learn that poor judgment can often be avoided simply by asking good questions. Samson's definitely guilty in this situation, of, of one, possibly two, common traits of those who suffer from poor judgment that lead to more injustice. We'll start the one that I, with the one that I'm not sure about, okay? I thought I was sure about this. I, I thought that he was guilty of this one. But as I look at the text and spent more time in the text, I'll just admit I could be wrong, okay? And, and in leaning to that this wasn't necessarily the case with Samson, but but potentially, and certainly it comes into play with a lot of decisions that people make that lead to injustice. In this case, Samson is upset because the dad gave the daughter, the wife, to somebody else, right? But who does Samson take his anger out on? The Philistines. Dad's a Philistine, so I take my anger out on all of the Philistines, right? Like, it's not just the dad that I have an issue with. It's everybody that's like the dad. Does this ever happen in our society? A, a lot of the racial stuff that we have in our society has been perpetuated because of an interaction with one individual or, or a small group of individuals from one ethnicity or another. So you have an interaction with, with the black person, and so all blacks are bad. Or you have an interaction with a cop, so all cops are bad. Or wh whatever it is, right? You have an interaction, a poor interaction with, with a man. So men are pigs because one man was a pig. So all men are pigs. And, and we, just, we just lump, right? It's the lumping everybody into a category syndrome. And, and it's possible that that's what Samson does. Like, well, I'm going to just kind of lump them all together. The, the dad messed me up and he, he, messed, he, he did me wrong. So anybody that's like him, I'm just going to lump in the same category as him, and I'm going to have the same hatred for all of them as I do for him. I call it the lump them all together syndrome, and you could spell syndrome with an S-I-N instead of an S-Y-N if you really want to, because this is where prejudice comes from. 
and we lump people in together instead of understanding that it was one individual or a, a small group of people that made a decision that had an action or said something, but we lump them all together and we allow hate to grow in our hearts towards a, a, a large group and we make poor decisions and create more injustice because of poor judgment based on a lump them all together syndrome. As I said, I, I don't know that Samson is guilty in this particular case of that. As I look more into the text, started questioning whether or not that was actually what had taken place. I certainly do think that it does take place, though, as we look at life in general. But certainly what we do see is we go back. Let, look at verse 3, if you would. Samson says this. He says, this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. So he's thinking of the Philistines. He's not just mad at the dad. He's mad at the Philistines who plowed with his heifer. That's what he said going back into chapter 14, right? If they wouldn't have threatened Samson's wife, I, I, as I looked at it, this is what I was starting to think this was Samson's thinking. If they wouldn't have threatened Samson's wife, Samson's wife wouldn't have told them the answer to the riddle, and Samson wouldn't have called his wife a heifer and gotten mad because he lost a bet. And the dad wouldn't have given the daughter to the best man. So Samson's anger goes back to the Philistines, right? It's their fault that I'm in this situation. It's their fault that, that my father-in-law gave my wife away. That's why, potentially, why Samson went back and said, okay, now I really have a right to, to get even with them. What's missing, though? What's missing? I mean, we can follow the timeline, and it, and it seems to make sense. But let's look at the timeline a little differently, shall we? Samson went to Philistine territory, right? Samson picked the girl. Samson decided to marry her. Samson taunted the Philistines with the riddle. Samson named the price. Samson was the only one who knew the secret. Samson was the one who told the secret. Samson was the one who left his bride. Samson was the one who didn't return for quite some time. Who should have Samson really been angry at? Himself. Oftentimes we make poor decisions. We have poor judgment that leads to more injustice because we don't see our own contribution to the problem. Can we, can we own that? Oftentimes, we have poor judgment that leads to more injustice because we don't see, we don't own our own contribution to the problem. If we look at things, Samson made one step after another step after another step after another step that led to this situation. It wasn't just somebody else's actions. Samson definitely contributed in this. Before you look to check others, you, you better check yourself. And you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And here's the thing, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself and you wreck others. Because as we follow along in this story, that's exactly what we see. As we go back to Judges chapter 15, we'll pick it up with verse 7. Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. I just point out, okay, he's going to get even. How many did they kill? How many did the Philistines kill? The dad and the daughter, right? How many, Samson's getting even. How many did he just kill? Many. Is that more than two? Yeah. Keep that in mind. He attacked them viciously, slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Edom. The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The men of Judah asked, why have you come to fight us? We have come to take Samson prisoner, they answered, to do to him as he did to us. What did they want? They want revenge. They want to get even. Hmm. Verse 11, then 3,000 men 
from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? Why have you done, what have you done to us? Why did you poke the bear? That's kind of what they're asking. Like, they're over us. Why did you create such a mess for us? Why did you poke the bear? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. I was just getting even. Here's a second observation. Fighting fire with fire leads to a bigger fire. Now, I know that with actual firefighting, that there are times where you set a fire to counteract another fire, right? To, to stop it. You burn up stuff so that the fire that's coming in can't take new territory. It can't build bigger. But in relationships, fighting fire with fire leads to a bigger fire. We, we see this in chapter 15. We, we see one action and a reaction. And that reaction causes another reaction, and things escalate, and things escalate quickly, right? How did it start off? A at the heart of things, at the beginning of chapter 15, we see a problem between one man and one man, right? A problem between Samson and his father-in-law. That's really all who should have been involved in this, this situation, but by the end of chapter 15, there are a lot more people that have been involved in this situation. A lot more people actually end up not just being involved in the situation, but dying because of the situation. Because fighting fire with fire just leads to a bigger fire. Samson thinks he's wrong. Then the Philistines think they're wrong. And then Samson's more wrong. And then the Philistines are more, like, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and we've probably seen this in our own lives, right? We think, well, I'm just going to get even. Going to have justice. And, and we, see this, we see this play out in individual lives and in our own neighborhoods. And things escalate. I remember working with teenagers, and oftentimes I thought if parents could just stay out of it, things would go a lot easier. But you get one teenage girl that's upset with another teenage girl, and they're having a little drama. D does drama ever happen among teenage girls? Not all of them, right? Lila never has teenage drama. Abby never has teenage drama, but... It happens, right? But then what happens? Moms get involved. Or dad. Or grandparents. Or older siblings. Or younger siblings. Or whatever. And you've got, you've got a family and a family. And, and sometimes you may even have like half of the church over here and half of the church over there. Why? Why? Because two individuals had a disagreement. And instead of somebody having the understanding, the wisdom to say, Let, let's de-escalate this, they just allowed it to escalate, to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Fighting fire with fire leads to a bigger fire. Escalated really, really quickly. We see something happen in this. Uh, one more instance of how poor judgment leads to more injustice. It's the tendency that most of us have to minimize the pain that we've inflicted while maximizing or magnifying the pain that's been inflicted on us. So, when we talk about getting even... It's, it's a combination of a couple things. One, we don't understand, like, how hard we hit them, right? Well, I barely hit you. Have you ever, like, you know, somebody gets upset and like, well, I, ba I barely hit you. But to them, it didn't feel like it, right? You thought you barely touched them. To them, they, they thought it felt more than that. So you minimize it. 
but in your eyes, they're magnifying it. So what happens? Caleb Kiley, will you come up here, please? Caleb wouldn't do this, okay? But here's what happens in life, right? He says, I punch you, then you're going to punch me back. Did you see that? <laughs> he hit me harder, didn't he? Is that what happens? Okay, I punch him, he punches me back. It's okay. He did it again. Okay? I'm, I'm barely touching him, but he's, he's I mean, he's not like, you kind of like that, don't you? He's not, not, now he's not just, he's not trying to knock me out or anything or knock me over, but, but he's hitting harder than I am. And that's a tendency that most of us have. It was the way my father raised us. Like, somebody hits you, you hit them harder. But what happens? I hit him, he hits me back. He hits me harder, so now we'll stop there. But it builds, right? It builds because... I didn't think I hit him that hard, but I thought he hit me harder. And so it just, it goes back and forth. Thanks, Caleb. Give Caleb a hand. <laughs> but we have this tendency to minimize our part of things. I didn't really hurt you. I, that, really? You're upset about that? I was joking. Couldn't you tell I was joking? But what you said, that really hurt. I mean, clearly what I said was joking, but what you said, that was just me. But likely they thought that what you said was me. But we minimize our part, we magnify somebody else's part. And we see that here in Judges chapter 15. They both said, we're just getting even. We just want to make things even. He set a fire, so we're going to kill a couple people. They killed a couple people, so I, I killed many people. Like, is that getting even, or is that like minimizing your part and magnifying their part? And when we do that, it, it's poor judgment, and it leads to more injustice. So, so what do we do instead of fighting fire with fire, instead of escalating things, de-escalating things. Well, I, I think asking questions is, is something that would be helpful. So let's, three things that I want to give you. I, I think this is quite practical. Instead of treating others the way that you felt you were mistreated, how about we treat others the way that we wish we would have been treated? So for instance, how do you like to be treated? Well, I think most of us want to know that we've been heard, right? You'd like to know that you've been heard. So how about, instead of treating them the way that we felt that we've been mistreated, how about we ask questions? Well, why did you say that? Why did you do that? What did I do that caused you to, to do that? I want to hear. I want to listen, Okay. I want to be heard, so I need to listen. Second thing, I want others to acknowledge when they've caused pain, when, when they've done something wrong. I, I like for others to acknowledge that. So when I'm being mistreated, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to, to show me, help me to see, like, what's my part in this? What do I need to own so that it, instead of escalating things, I can go to them and I can say, you know what? I see that I contributed to, to this situation. I'm going to own my part. I, I, I messed up. I said something I shouldn't have said. I used a tone I shouldn't have used. I did this, and I shouldn't have done that. I did this without checking with you, and I shouldn't have done Whatever the case is, we own our part because that's what we would want somebody else to do. Third is we want others to extend grace, right? When we mess up, we want others to forgive us, right? We, we want others to understand. We want others to say, you know what? 
I really believe that, that you didn't intend to hurt me. Or I, I, I really believe that you are, that you're sorrowful, that, that you're repentant. And, and I want to I move on, and I want, I want us to rebuild this relationship. We would want others to do that for us, so let's do that for others. Instead of escalating, I think we can de-escalate primarily by doing those three things. We continue on, Judges chapter 15. Let's pick it up, verse 12. So Samson had just said, I merely did to them what they did to me. me." Verse 12, they said to him, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him, shouting, and then, we see this, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. Again, Samson is the Lord's anointed. God had foreordained that he would use Samson for his glory, for the good of his people and for his glory. Samson doesn't always get it right, but God is going to still use Samson. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. A thousand men. One guy took out a thousand men. Then Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone, look at the play, of, play on words here. With a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. Now, this is true, right? Samson killed a thousand men. But that's only half true, right? Samson, with the power of God, killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramath-Lehi. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given me, given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? So he is, he's, he's, first he flexes, right? Like, look what I've done. I've, I've made donkeys of all these guys. But then... At the end of the day, he's thirsty, and so he has a little bit of a humbling, and like, hey, uh, Lord, um, you helped me out here, but now look at me. And something took place in Samson, and we see a third observation. Being full of oneself leads to being empty. Being full of oneself leads to being empty. The only thing bigger than Samson's biceps was his head. I'm like, just, he, Right? Like, look what I've done. We see it. We saw it in the previous chapter, in chapter 14. We see it now in chapter 15. Pride rears its ugly head. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look what I've done. There's no look what God's done. It's look what I've done. There's no isn't God awesome. It's aren't I awesome. I I want us to understand this. Success is often the enemy of of humility. Sometimes the most damaging thing to our spiritual walk is success. Because it goes to our head and we begin to think that we're all that in a bag of chips. Samson does, right? Samson thinks he's all that. Like he's 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 going to hurt himself patting himself on the back. Like, look what I've done. I'm so awesome. Instead of praising the Lord, ins- instead of reflecting glory to God and, and saying, G- God did this, I praise God because he, he gave me the ability to do something that I wouldn't have been able to do on my own. I mean, Scripture was clear that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power, but Samson begins by just saying, it, it was me. It was me until, until he's about to die of thirst. And it's like, hey, uh, Lord, you had a hand in this. Um, 
would you help me out? It's imperative that we keep in mind that without him, we are nothing. Without him, we are nothing. Jesus said this uh, in his own way in John chapter 15. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me and I will abide in me. But then he says, apart from me, you can do a little bit. Apart from me, you can do some pretty cool things. No, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Being full of oneself leads to one being empty. The key to humility is recognizing our dependence on God. Without Him, I'm nothing. I'm not all that in a bag of chips. I'm not even all that. Without Him, I'm nothing. I am what I am by the grace of God, period. But I love this as we finish up the chapter. Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi. What does hollow indicate? There's nothing in it, right? It's empty. But this is God we're talking about. He makes empty places full. Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. So the spring was called in Hakar, and it's still, it is still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. I, I love this. That God specializes in bringing something from nothing. God is not lacking. Samson got it wrong in a lot of ways, but, but he got it right, and he really got it right at the end of this chapter. He got to the end and recognized that he wasn't smart enough, he wasn't strong enough, he couldn't flex his way out of dehydration. And he called on the name of the Lord. And his strength returned and he was revived. Here's a final observation. Prayers of humility lead to God's provision. Psalm 10 verse 17 says it this way. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will make your ear attentive. I was going to close the service and, and was more going to focus on giving God glory and, and, and focusing on that way. But I want to take it a, a different direction. Felt inclined that we need to go a different direction and just begin with the humility of saying, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Not just saying, God, you've been awesome, but Lord, I need you. And maybe you're not at Samson's position where you're dying of thirst and like, I'm going to die if, if you don't step in. But maybe you're pretty close to it. I don't, I don't know exactly what's going on in your heart, your life, but here's what I know. I know we all need him because without him, we are nothing. Without him, we can do nothing. And so as we finish our song or finish our service th this morning, I, I want to finish with the song, Lord, I Need You, with an invitation if you want to come forward to the altar and say, Lord, I need you, or you want to sit in the seat and say, Lord, I need you, or stand and say, Lord, whatever it may look like, but in your heart of hearts, acknowledging that you need God to do what only God can do. That you don't have all the answers, you don't have all the strength. That you need Him to do what only He can do. And you say, with all humility, all transparency, all authenticity, Lord, I need you. Here's what I believe. I believe He'll answer I believe he'll provide because he's that kind of God. Would you stand with me if you're able? And whatever you need to do to cry out to God and to say, Lord, I need you, I invite you to do that. Father, have your way. May we humbly 
come to you. I pray this in and for your name. Amen.